In 100 years' time, possibly sooner, we could rewrite the facts of life. We could make a baby without a sperm and without an egg. The question is, do we want to? The facts of life, the birds and the bees, are seen as pretty things. Since the beginning of time, egg meets sperm. But new developments in biology might change the way we reproduce and revolutionise how we treat infertility. But not just that. This new science could impact regenerative medicine, disease modelling, gene editing and CRISPR, organoids, personalised cell therapies. Stem cell research has the potential to change medicine altogether. Let's start at the beginning with what these stem cells actually are. We all start out as embryos. This bit of the embryo here, the inner cell mass, is made up of embryonic stem cells, a type of pluripotent stem cell that exists in the embryo just when it's getting started. Pluripotent stem cells will eventually create every tissue in the body. But right now, they haven't decided what part of the body they're going to form. You can think of them as a cell without a job. They can go on to be anything. But then they choose a speciality to build a part of the body. So this cell becomes a heart cell, this one a brain cell, and that's their career. This process is called differentiation. But once a cell is differentiated, that's it. It can't change career paths. It is that cell forever. Or so we thought. In 2006, an incredible scientific breakthrough found a way to turn a differentiated cell back into something like a pluripotent stem cell. This meant that scientists could now return adult differentiated cells to a pluripotent state. And all of a sudden, this cell could start its career all over again and become anything. These cells are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And for a while now, scientists have been building on this breakthrough to create new tissues in order to model parts of organs like the heart, lungs and liver, which are called organoids. But remember, pluripotent stem cells can be coaxed to make any tissue or cells in the body. And extraordinarily, they can also be used to recreate embryonic tissue. When this happens, it's called a stem cell-based embryo model. And some, although not all, can look almost identical to a human embryo. Scientists have grown something that closely resembles an early human embryo without using sperm, eggs or a womb. So this is very, very exciting science and raises all sorts of different possibilities. Uh, I think probably the most exciting uh, immediate use is to understand more about embryological development in what's often described as this black box between 14 and 28 days, when it's illegal to do research on embryos and there aren't any other sources of embryos. Understanding more about that has the potential to transform our understanding of, for example, miscarriage and IVF failure. And by using induced pluripotent stem cells, you could make your own replacement organ, create your own personal blood supply, test out new medications on your own tissue. But what does this all have to do with sperm and eggs and the future of fertility treatment? So one very exciting possible use of this technology is to make sperm and eggs from stem cells. What this involves is taking an adult cell, for example a skin cell, and coaxing it, inducing it into becoming pluripotent, which means that they can differentiate into all of the different tissues and cells in the human body. And of course, one of those is sperm and eggs. And then we're back to the age old story of egg meets sperm, only with a slight footnote that it's actually skin cell meets skin cell, or to be more accurate, in vitro derived sperm meets in vitro derived egg. There's the potential to make a baby that is biologically related to both parents, regardless of the parent's age, medical status, or even possibly sex. And it gets even more interesting. There could be the potential to have more than two biological parents. What that would generally involve is perhaps making a sperm from stem cells and an egg from somebody else's stem cells and fertilising them to create an embryo and extracting stem cells from that embryo with which you then make, decide to make sperm, which you fertilise with somebody else's egg. So in that case, you've got three people whose genetic material was involved. And you could say, which is a bit weird, that one of the parents was actually an embryo, i.e. somebody who didn't ever exist. It certainly is mind-boggling. And this technology could enable people who currently can't have biologically related children to do so. And that could transform the reproductive options for lots and lots of people. But we're not there yet. And I think it's really important to stress that the path from 
here to this being used in fertility clinics is, is a long one. And in this country, you would need new legislation to make it even lawful to use these induced pluripotent stem cell derived gametes. So we're quite a long way off. But the fact that it's possible um, and the fact that scientists are talking about a, a realistic time scale in the next maybe 10, 20 years, I think makes this pretty exciting. I think when the public hears about embryo model research, they tend to be very excited by its possibilities, but also to be quite surprised that there isn't regulation here. So stem cell based embryo models are currently pretty much unregulated in the UK because they're not embryos for the purposes of the regulation of embryo research but in relation to human tissue regulation they're not relevant material so they kind of fall between the cracks as long as you've got the tissue donor's consent there isn't really much restriction on what you can do with them. My interest is as a lawyer um, and I'm interested in the role of the law here. I was really interested in trying to find a way to engage the public to pose some questions about where the limits should lie and for doing that, I work with the liminal space to set up a, a fictional product, Sell Yourself, to try to spark conversations about what do you think about this? Where should the limits be? And we also had a quiz where people could tell us what they thought. Um, and this is just a snapshot. But I think one thing that was quite interesting is that people's reaction is not to say this is about Frankenstein science. It's much more to say, well, this is very exciting. I'm excited about this. I want to know more about it. But two other things that I think are really significant here. People are really worried about whether they would likely to have access to, to this technology. So people are very concerned about commercialisation and health inequalities. I think in terms of the specific issue of embryo models and what the developmental limit should be, they really don't want scientists to be developing entities in the laboratory that have anywhere close to developing pain or consciousness. You are about to see a historic birth following in vitro fertilisation. When the first IVF baby was born in 1978, it was really shocking, the idea of fertilising an egg outside of a woman's body and it leading to the birth of a baby. And there was huge scepticism about that, including from the medical establishment. But now IVF is routine, normal. There have been 10 million wanted babies born worldwide. And one of the crucial steps, I think, in that process of normalisation. But another, I think, is regulation, that IVF is strictly regulated. And I think that has helped people see that it's safe and it's effective and it's controlled. In relation to stem cell-based embryo models, I think there's a consensus amongst policymakers, amongst regulators, and crucially amongst the scientists, that there needs to be some sort of regulation. I think we're seeing in relation to AI that um, the, the science is extraordinary, but actually it has ethical, legal, social, cultural implications that also need to be taken into account. And my claim would be that developmental biology is raising issues that are just as significant as AI, where the social, ethical, legal, cultural implications are just as important, and we need social scientists to be thinking about those.